All right, everybody. So this is Q and A part three, or the third Q and A rather that we are doing with Dave McConey. Dave, thanks for being on. Happy to do it, man. What time is it over there now? Is it after ten? It's uh ten seventeen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, which is really fucked up because I should go to bed in like two or three hours, and I don't feel sleepy at all. So maybe I had too much energy drinks. So you go to sleep around one in the morning? Yeah. Oh jeez. Yeah. Well, tomorrow is like Saturday anyway. PM, so <laughs> <laughs> you go to bed at nine p.m. Uh, I start winding down at nine p.m. I probably get to sleep about ten, and then I wake up around five thirty. I'm always forcing myself to go to bed a little bit later because the last time I was dieting for a long time, eventually my circadian rhythms freaking shifted back to like I was waking up at like 5 a.m., sometimes even before. And I was going to bed at a time which basically precluded me from doing anything socially. So my default answer to everything was like, no, sorry, not yeah, going. Right. have to go to bed. <laughs> um so, so yeah, folks, this is a Q&A and this is part two or part one. The other part of this, so Q&A number three, part one or part two, whatever we are going to call it, is on Dave's channel. So this is going to be like whatever, half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that. If you want to watch the other half, then go over to Dave's channel. So with that, um, yeah, the first thing I want to address here is... Um, I got a lot of questions about this casein pudding recipe <laughs> or amazing meal that I posted on Instagram. People want to know how I did it. Guys, it's it's embarrassingly simple. So I wish I could take credit for some cooking skills or whatever food prep food preparation skills. No. So the thing is I take a bowl, take the casein powder, I put I used to put in 3 scoops, so I was getting like 70 grams of protein, 72 grams of protein and around like 300 calories added around like 400, 500 milliliters of water. So like half a liter and uh, just mixed it until like the whole thing was kind of meshed together with some casein powders. You will have to be more careful because if you add water too quickly, it will just like clunk up really badly. This one somehow just never clunks up. So it's, it's pretty nice. And um, then once it's mixed together to a decent degree, it will still be a little bit watery. So ideally you add as much water so that it's like just a bit too watery to actually eat it with a spoon. And at that point you take like this like electronic pen mixer thing and you just like mix it for like 10, 15 minutes maybe. And eventually it will like start to have this really nice consistency. Now, my casein pro protein powder has some xanthan gum added into it like on its own. So I cannot get around that. So probably that's part of the reason why it like fluffs up so nicely. If you don't have that, then just add some xanthan gum to it. Just be careful because A, if you add too much, then it's going to get like way too thick and you cannot actually mix it because like it will, I did it once, I added too much and then it's like freaking like wrapped around the mixer. So I <laughs> had to throw the whole thing out. Um, and B, too much xanthan gum is like freaking gastrointestinal nightmare for a lot of people. So just be careful. You don't want to spend the whole night like running out to the toilet because you have the most horrible diarrhea. And that, that's it. I didn't add anything else. So this is not a protein fluff. I didn't add frozen berries and whatever. But um, lately, I've been actually using only two scoops. So it's like 200 calories, like half a liter of water, some xanthan gum. And I have like a bowl like this big. It's like half a kilo of awesomeness for not that much calories, which for the dieting man is like heaven. So that's it. Um, all right. So now I'm going to involve Dave finally. So um, basically kind of an in-depth question so we can go into it as much as we want. But what do we think of uh, this uh, new high volume study that came out recently, which was basically once again confirming that higher volumes, so long as you can recover from it, are better. So for anybody who don't know, like it was kind of similar to the Schoenfeld, like uh, 45 set study. I think in this one, they only did like 30 sets. And um, I'm forgetting how much volume the other gr group did, but uh, they were, I think, still doing a, a reasonable amount of volume, I think 10 plus sets. 
and they had like better results in every metric, like strength, size gains in every limb that they measured. So fuck Dave, like, do we have some explaining to do now that we are not recommending super high volumes? <laughs> um, who who reviewed this study? Was that did Menno have a review on it? Uh, yeah, I think it, it was Menno's. Uh, I think it may have been the the guy that you had on your podcast. Is it uh, Kevin Callum? Kenneth? Cody Hahn. Not not Cody Hahn. The um, the guy who was debating uh, Paul Canoe. Oh oh um, yeah yeah Calvin. Calvin, so maybe it was something with a K or a C. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So was that the one you sent me where we were talking about like the different, like the leg press and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I thought that was a, a pretty good study. Uh, I, I also am not that surprised that on, because I mean, it wasn't, it, they weren't beginners, but they weren't advanced, right? Yeah. Like in most studies, like they were seriously trained lifters, I think, but not not a Scott Stevenson or whatever. Jeff Albers. Yeah. yeah, right. So I I mean, I don't to be clear, I'm not debating that on a short-term basis higher volume training will result in more growth. I mean, it, it's a kind of classic like stimulus response, right? I mean, there's a point and, and while they debate that like, oh, we haven't reached that point in the studies yet, I, I don't think anybody is really needing or benefiting much from like 40 sets, especially 40 sets of failure. I, I just think that's crazy. But um, yeah, if you said, hey, we're going to do a 12 week study. And I mean, even if you said for, to me, like, hey, I've said how many times now that like, I just can't, I, like, I, I don't put on any more size. But if I were to do like 20 sets of arms for the next 12 weeks, I'd probably put on like a really small amount. A lot of it might just be like inflammation and then it would probably go away. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've done a specialization phase before. So um, my whole thing is I'm not overly concerned with the short-term results. I'm more interested in a sustainable, uh, you know, very well, able, <laughs> a sustainable approach. And I don't think that like long-term it matters much at all, you know, as evidenced by the fact that I've been training, you know, paying on when you count like my start date, like 15 to 17 years. Well, I'm doing higher volume now, like I said, I'm on Q and A number one or on my channel for this one. So I'm doing just left arm training or I'm adding volume for my left arm, right? Well, if higher volume was the answer, then the fact that my, I mean, I only do six sets of direct bicep training per week. So adding three sets for my left bicep is a 50% increase in volume hasn't made any difference. Why? Because I'm done, <laughs> right? I mean, unless I start blasting gear, I'm done. So it didn't matter that I, I could double the volume. I could do any amount of volume unless, I mean, I said to you this morning, like I weighed in this morning and my weight, for, for a given weight, my waistline, calipers, and arms are the same. Meaning that like, obviously somebody said to me in the comments, some video I did in there, it doesn't make any sense. If you just ate more, like, of course you gain muscle. It's like, yeah, I never said <laughs> that wouldn't be the case. Obviously, if I ate to 250 pounds, I'd be significantly bigger and more muscular and stronger. By the time I cut back down, I wouldn't have netted anything is the point. And that's just how it is after this many years. And that's fine. But the high volume just wouldn't do anything for me. And so if it's, hey, I want to get to the end result as fast as possible. And I want to do it in five years. And I don't care about injury risk or anything like that. Or if I get burned out. Yeah, I'd put you on a higher volume routine, but most of the people who come to me, it's like, hey, I've been doing this for years. I'm stalled out. I'm burned out. This sucks. What's going on? And I mean, consistently, I put them on a low volume routine and they make progress. So I understand that these studies show this, but in terms of real world, real world results, it's just not really what I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, pr pretty much the same here. I mean, I think um, I think it's it's potentially worth exploring higher volumes for for basically anybody who has stalled out on on lower volumes or even someone who hasn't stalled out but just wants to see how far they can push things i have certainly done that in the past and how well it worked all i can tell is i was still making strength gains in the gym and all i can say is that over the last two years i have gotten bigger but I, you know, uh, muscle growth is too slow 
to really discern like okay in which period did i make better gains because it, it's something that happens over like many many months so i think you c it's completely fine to experiment with it um keep in mind that uh, this study was actually a lot better than the schoenfeld one in that some of those criticisms that were addressed there such as the very short rest periods um that was not an issue here so they were actually resting for long enough between sets i think i also recall them um actually specifying that they really made sure that the post workout like inflammation actually went down when they actually took the measurement so that's good but also keep in mind that this study was uh, i'm forgetting how long it was but it had like i think nine subjects or something so you know is 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 that does that mean that the study is invalid no but also like just don't ha hang your head on it um overall i think it is definitely a good sign that most of these studies that have come out in recent years kind of in in the same way that in the the case of the refeeds at least is a good sign that all of them are showing at least not a negative effect so by increasing volume so if like it was completely 50 50 like some showed better results some showed worse results then that would not be great so look experiment with higher volumes if you want to see how far you push it one thing i will say is i would only do it and i only do it with my clients in those cases in a gaining phase so if you're currently cutting and you're making good progress like i'm sorry this is not the time to start upping the volume and especially if progress is slow like no like volume is only going to go one way during a cut and that's down because <laughs> like recovery is the issue in that case so uh when you're bulking sure play around just do it slowly and conservatively i would never increase volume by more than 10 to 20 percent at any given time test it out for one or two weeks if everything is fine then maybe do another small bump and uh you know you might actually bump up your volume to like 50 sets like i did it uh, just keep in mind always that when you do that, things will will become much murkier. So the benefit of doing only a moderate amount of volume is that things are just like the noise to signal ratio is is very favorable. So you're easily able to pick pick out trends, see what is actually happening with your progression, because you don't have to always worry about like well you know, is this really a plateau in my progression or just temp some temporary fatigue? Maybe this is actually expected because, you know, I just did so much volume that maybe some weird like fitness fatigue relationship is going on here. So you will have a lot more of that. Also, you might get niggled more often, like little injuries are creeping in. So you have to work around things a lot more. Like that's one thing I definitely found when I was doing like 40 plus sets is that, my training setup had to change like every couple of weeks <laughs> i had to modify rep ranges like swap out some exercises because like man like you're pounding on your joints like three four times more compared to when you were doing only like 10 or 12 sets or something like that so how much are you doing per week now man nine or ten sets like uh i, I was doing like 12 14 um earlier on in the diet but just uh progress started to slow down and you know like and before that it was good but deeper into that all of a sudden it's not good so yeah like volume had to go only one way so yeah a similar question as on the volume stuff uh, what do we think of the whole p ratio um issue so are you concerned dave that if someone bulks up to too high of a fat percentage then they will hold their their muscle gaining uh, process um, or progress. Yeah, I just, it, sometimes like when you hear people, I mentioned this with um, Vigorous Steve on the podcast where I said, when I watched him with Derek and Leo and like watching it, I was like, there were so many times where I wanted to like jump in and give my opinion, you know? Uh, and a lot of it because we were on like the same page and I listened to a mass review with Eric Trexler and he was talking about this and it was like literally exactly what I think I said to you. I think it was, it was you regarding like football players and bulking up. And it was like, these are like my exact words <laughs> um, because 
the whole idea with the P ratio, um, for people who are like super unfamiliar, it's like the ratio of fat to muscle gain. And people will, well, there were studies showing that leaner individuals gained more muscle relative to fat than fatter individuals. However, as Lyle McDonald has been quick to point out, this is not the case for people who diet down to leaner levels. It was the case for people who were naturally leaner. So it, it's kind of a moot issue because it's like, well, if you diet down to that lean level, it's not gonna be as beneficial. But I think most of us have kind of seen that like, these naturally lean guys, they can bulk up and it's like, dude, like, like Steve Hall, right? It's like, dude, like you're just like always lean, like regardless of how much weight you gain. Now, obviously he gained some fat too, but like he's always been lean. I mean, if you look at pictures before he lifted, he was just like striated packs, right? And so it's not really that surprising. Yeah. I have a friend, Kevin, who was like the same way, he's just always lean. Um, and so that's, that's one aspect. But then two, I just think like, if you just look in like the real world, it's like, show me the like biggest, strongest guys. And they're like professional football players. Like, like sumo wrestlers have some like the highest lean body mass. Now, again, the ratio might be a little off, um, but there's very few people who, if they, they're gaining weight, the strength, they're just like, I'm just not getting any stronger. Like for the most part, if you're getting bigger, you're getting stronger. Um, now, again, I'm not saying just keep balking and balking until like you're obese, but I, I just think that's one of those things that doesn't matter that much. And, and on the other side of that, when people do cut down too much, we know from some like case studies and just a ton of anecdote that most people who finish a contest prep, they gain a lot of fat afterwards, right? When in theory, they should be so primed to put on a bunch of muscle that's really been, um, you know, that, that myth has kind of been debunked at this point that no, like you, you really just gain a lot of fat afterwards, despite in theory, your P ratio should be so great. Yeah, exactly. That's, um, that's always a bit of a, so, okay. We all acknowledge that right after a contest, when you get super, super lean, you're primed mainly to put on fat, but then somehow there is that like in between optimal zone where you're like much more primed to put on muscle and not as much fat. So, I mean, I think it wouldn't shock me if there was actually a point where so many things are just going in a not good direction inside the body where it would actually become a problem. Like just, just kind of logically thinking about it when you're whatever at like 40% body fat as a guy, like you're not in a very healthy state o overall. Now, it, would it be that shock? I'm not saying that's the case. And it also wouldn't shock me if like what Eric Trexler is saying would pan out that it just doesn't seem to matter, like because American football players and whatnot. But like, it, it wouldn't shock me if amongst other things, also like anabolic signaling and, and muscle repair and these things would not be functioning at 100% capacity. So it wouldn't be shocking. But at the same time, we just see too many anecdotes for that, I think as well. And um, also, it was very interesting just to read these, um, this back and forth between Greg and Eric and then Menno, because Menno's rebuttal to their their article was very compelling at first. I read it. I didn't read it in like very great detail, but then like the points he made and stuff, I was like, damn, like Eric and Greg will have to be on top top of their games to combat this. And then I read there. I mean, basically he, he outlined some theoretical and also kind of uh, anthropological or not anthropological, um, like basically extrapolations from like hunter gatherer societies and also just some things that we know mechanistically like okay higher body fat percentage means generally higher blood sugar levels like higher rates of insulin resistance which means higher levels of inflammation inflammation will be inhibitory for muscle repair and muscle growth in these and these ways and um you know citation 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 which Admittedly, I didn't bother to like check all of them. Um, but then when Greg and Eric were addressing them, it's like, okay, well, it's very compelling and everything, but like, this is a study about like muscle repair and muscle hypertrophy. Cause sometimes it was just like a blanket statement, like, you know, uh, higher levels of inf inflammation are directly inhibitory for muscle growth or muscle hypertrophy. And then link like whatever, a study with like 
five participants who are like over 90 year old whatever nursing patients who i don't know <laughs> who were like burnt severely burnt in a car accident beforehand so it's like well, okay okay but it's maybe a bit of a wild extrapolation from that so um yeah i think i i wouldn't be worried about that so much i think um most people have plenty of reasons anyway to not want to get that fat. So I'm actually gonna do a I, I, I'm actually gonna do a video on this soon. Like basically my ultimate blueprint for deciding this never-ending dilemma, cut, cut or bulk. It's like, look, probably you got into lifting because you want to look a certain way. Probably that's a reasonably lean, muscular, athletic looking physique. If you're currently considerably fatter than that already then just know that if you go into a bulk you're only going to get even fatter so you're basically for the next four to six months which is kind of a good time frame for a successful bulk you're only going to see yourself getting further and further away from your ideal physique if you first go into a cut then at least you know the leanness side of things is taken care of and by the end of your bulk you will still be in shooting distance from the way you will eventually want to look. So do I really need some evidence-based reason for you to not want to get up to like 30, 40% body fat? I don't really think so. But maybe if um, we can take away one thing from this is any kind of needless fear mongering about the idea that you know, 15% or even like 20% is the upper limit to which you should be pushing a bulk. If muscle growth is only the thing that you're worried about, probably you don't have to worry. You can bulk up to a nice, saucy, you know, bulky, relatively chubby physique, and you will still be fine. So yeah, that's basically my two cents, slightly more than two cents. Um... All right, so this one is a good one actually because I'm I'm realizing that um, I haven't been addressing this maybe as much as I should have because a lot of people are in this situation. But uh, what are some exercises that we would recommend for training at home with minimal equipment? So, Dave, what are your thoughts on this? And maybe we can also address like what pieces of equipment we would actually recommend getting? Um, let me see if you can even like see this. Probably not. Well, let's see. So I have like bands over there. You can see a little like weight tree in the corner, a bike. And, and that was for upper body. I mean, I actually work out at home on Wednesdays. My like upper hypertrophy day, I just do here. Um, so I, it depends on what you mean by like minimal equipment. I mean, if you're talking like purely body weight, that's a little harder, obviously. But if yeah. you even have, like, I have adjustable dumbbells and like a couple hundred pounds of weights, like maybe two hundred pounds total. Um, so that allows me to do a ton because I, I mean, if I push ups to failure, um, get a backpack, weighted push ups. I mean, that that to me, you know, I could maybe do body weight like sixty push ups. I would say so Ooh, that putting. Makes a lot. You know, so I tested it the other day just to see. It was actually after my three-day fast. So after my three-day fast, I did 25, like, rapid pull-ups. You know, definitely not, like, ideal form. Just kind of up, down, up, down. And then 60 push-ups. And I have a friend who is, like, who, I don't know, he's just <laughs> very top-heavy. And I don't know if he has his light bones. The dude just did, like, he, he just went and tried. He did, like, 114 push-ups or something ridiculous. So, wow. Um, yeah, I don't know. He's just very upper body dominant. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I mean, push ups. If you can get a pull up bar, like I have a pull up bar here that was like $20 that just hangs on the door, super convenient. Um, so if you want specific exercise, yeah, let's say pull ups, push ups, obviously. I mean, it's a lot of like obvious stuff. Um, I find, I mean, it, it's harder to get now with the whole uh, craziness in the world, but I think if you can get a set of dumbbells, that's like super helpful. Um, bands can be really helpful <laughs> in some circumstances especially one particular band that... right right yeah <laughs> um they they can be very helpful uh and I, I really do believe that i i i haven't personally had any like just band training like i've done band training but not like just bands 
Um, but it does seem that like the research on it shows that it can be fine. You know, if you look, look at mechanism of muscle growth, there's no reason why it can't work. Um, yeah, what do you think? Um, yeah, so basically my, my core, my core essential shopping list for, for home training would be number one, a pull-up bar. Like I always say, like if you, if you sign up for coaching with me and your gym is closed, just get a pull-up bar. If you have that, we will be able to make something work. Uh, like I think we are so lucky as humans that our body is heavy enough relative to the strength of our arms and other muscles like the last that are involved in a pull-up or a chin-up that that those exercises just with body weight will remain effective from like year zero of training until year 20 of training by the way i just wanted to comment that pull-up uh, thing that you posted on instagram like i was actually super impressed because i i think the most uh like decent looking pull-ups which yours were i think maybe i got up to 20 once but that was like the last ones were like ugly so 25 is like fucking impressive on pull-ups and on a three-day fast <laughs> well yeah yeah because like even like these big strong guys that are posting like these pull-up challenges like i can tell immediately as soon as i see the title like if i see any number above 20 i can already tell that it will be like 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 these like half pull-ups and your yours were like full rump so uh good, good on you um so pull-up bar number one number two yeah dumbbells just uh adjustable dumbbell and then as many weight plates as you can afford um beyond that i mean really a barbell is um no nah, i don't think it's really needed if you have those two things um i will say that if you somehow cannot get a pull-up bar which for a long time i couldn't so like these freaking door frames that i have here and the thickness of the wall is such that those that go over the door frame like those just don't work here like i just couldn't put it up i bought one of those that you like twist in in between the door frame and uh, it fucking like collapsed under me. So I actually, I I was really lucky that I didn't destroy my knees forever because I literally fell on my knees from like a decent height. It just got super red. So I just, I just looked like I was giving blowjobs left and right for, <laughs> for, for, for a few days. Um, so that happened. Uh, but if you have a barbell and you don't have uh, a pull-up bar, you could... Like just put it in between like two chairs or two sofas and you could do like these modified pull-ups so it's almost like assisted pull-ups with your like ass and kind of feet down on the ground uh so you yeah, can like do that rack chins they call them um, yeah yeah you know you, you put your feet up on a chair you can put some like if you have any extra weight to put on your you know your midsection and then just kind of do like a modified pull-up yeah uh, now that i think of it you could maybe even just do it with a freaking table right like you could just sit on i found the table. that kind of hard yeah I, it had to be a pretty high table um yeah. yeah and a pretty supportive table yeah or like between two like uh like larger like shelves or something if you have them at the same size like i have it for example like the like around the tvs i probably could somehow hang up on those with my feet up somewhere but anyway so I just want to take a moment to note Abel's jawline as he turned to the side there. We can see you're getting quite lean. Really? Oh. <laughs> but it is giving away that I'm cutting this shit and I'm not going to a barber because it's like freaking oh, yeah. even. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and then, so if you want to get fancier, then one thing you could get is these like really simplistic like uh, cable pulleys. So not like not like a cable tower because that will cost you like a, over a thousand bucks, but you know I'm sure you've seen these like you can hang them up somewhere and you can have a, an upper pulley and then sometimes it comes with a combo so you can have a lower pulley as well and those are like really cheap I think like under a hundred bucks so and you can hang just like weights off of them so yeah yeah what do you think for lower body because that's that's where I get a little stumped and, and I'll be honest like I. I could do it to maintain, but I just don't, 
like when you think about it logically, it's like why why wouldn't you be able to gain optimal size that way based on like you know again like the mechanism of action and all of that. I just don't see it happening if you're just trying if you don't have a lot of equipment. Um, I do think that like it's going to be very hard to replicate. You know, oh, you could do pistol squats, and it's like, dude, pistol squats are hard, and you know, like a one-legged body weight squat and and all that can be hard. I just, I just don't see that putting on the same amount of muscle. I don't know. Like, I, I just don't think you're going to get like optimal leg development doing that. Now, if you have the dumbbells and you can do like Bulgarian split squats and you can progress on those, um, like. I, podcast coming out tomorrow brian borstein and i were talking about like we were doing like 200 pound split squats so like yeah i, I think you can develop some good leg development from that uh I, but i i don't really have a lot of like other great answers for body weight I, I actually do think that's a time that like the bands could be helpful but you'd have to set it up in a certain way because otherwise it's going to be very easy at the bottom and I mean, obviously that, 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 that at least follows the strength curve of a squat, you know? Um, so if you had enough bands, that could actually be a reasonable way to do it, but you'd have to make sure that there's still enough tension at the bottom. So you're not just doing the quarter squats, but like, I'm just thinking like, if I, if I just had to like do a leg day here, even with what I have, it would be tough. You know, Bulgarian split squats would be pretty much like what my go-to. Yeah. I mean, without, without any equipment, train the lower body is, is hard. And, um, I mean, first of all, if you have your gym closed and you have very minimal equipment, I mean, just forget about optimal, just shoot for something <laughs> just, just yeah. for good enough, you know? Uh, and you can certainly at least maintain your leg size, um, barring extreme. Ex I mean, I certainly can cause, uh, <laughs> don't have the legs of a beast, but, um, Things you can do with just body weight, yeah, like pistol squats are are hard and like you can do them assisted. Uh, the the quads are easier to hit. Like one thing I really like is these like against the door frame or against the wall, like sliding hex squats. So you like push your back like firmly against the door frame, and you stand basically as close as you can to the door frame with your feet, so that your heels are not coming off as you're squatting down. And that's actually surprisingly challenging. So even if you have dumbbells that go up to like, you know, like 20 kilos. So what is that? Like 45 pounds or something like that. What uh, is that it you're doing? Like, uh, describe it again. So basically it's like, um, here is the door and you're pu you push your back against the door. And as you're squatting up and down, you're like sliding up and down the door. So it's basically like a, I, I call it like wall sliding hex squat. Um, but when you have similar, I mean, I, cause I've done something like that with like a Smith machine where like I kind of step a little further out and I do like a Smith hack squat, like as far as like, yeah. you know, the setup is similar, but I mean, I, I could use similar weights to what I would squat. I mean, I would do like 300 pounds on that. I just, it's hard for me to imagine, but maybe I'm, yeah. I would have to see how you're doing it because like just today I was uh, squatting in the Smith machine like relatively quote unquote normally. So I was, uh, my feet were like basically just under me and I could squat like um, like 10 kilos more for like two more reps. So I was like much stronger than, than when it's further, when my legs are further out forward. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like to see it. But I mean, I guess because you're just taking more of your like torso muscles out, you're like your hips are taken out of the, the movement sure. a lot more. Um, but when I was doing it at home, like I found it pretty challenging and, and maybe like you're adding a little bit of extra difficulty because of like the friction with the door. I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, those ones I, I programmed in for, for um, like for a lot of the clients that I work together with who only could train at home. And, um, yeah, I also saw that like they are using like not super crazy heavy dumbbells and they're getting reps like eight, 10, whatever. So that's a decent option. High step ups are also a decent option. So you just make sure that you're not like really pushing yourself up with your other foot or other leg. And that's also pretty good. And Bulgarian split squats are also pretty good. Uh, it's just like most people hate it for, for a good reason because <laughs> yeah, they are, so. um, 
what what would you say so this is something i was trying to answer to someone the other day uh what do you think is like the like the least taxing like just like systematically taxing but still like very effective like quad movement because like the most difficult is definitely leg press for me um yeah i mean i just say like a leg extension but I, I i would be inclined to say like a good hex squat machine like because leg extensions are just like fucking painful like they just burn so badly for like lower reps they don't yeah i don't know like because i was talking to somebody who like i think leg curls burn the most like a high rep leg curl really? to me kills high rep like today i did well i i do um breast pause and i'll do like I do like 20 reps and then I'll wait 40 seconds and then I'll do, you know, like eight and then I'll rest 40 seconds and then I'll do like seven. And then I go from that into a 60 second, like intense quad stretch. And I, it's tough, but it's not like, I don't, it's, it's isolated to like the quads. Like it burns, but as far as like, oh, this is so hard, I would find like a 12 rep, I would, that, doing that same rep scheme with, like a hack squat, I would find that like. Well, yeah, yeah, that one definitely. But, but anyway, so um, that's the tough thing with training quads at home is that even with like really good specialized equipment, it's a lot of it is just kind of a mental struggle. And then when you're doing high rep Bulgarian split squats, which often the only thing you can do, it's like just like starting out a set where you have like twenty more reps, like. You know, just third, fourth, fifth rep, and you know, like just knowing that you have 50 more to go, and it, it's a lot of. And it, I think, when you're done, you got to do the other side. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah, one like single leg, like compound quad work is just ugh, horrible, uh, but it does the job. So the hamstrings are more difficult to train at home, I would say. And um, I mean, if you have dumbbells, then you can do RDLs. If they are not that heavy, then you can do single leg RDLs, which are decent. Um, for leg curl type movements, uh, if you have a suspension device, like a TRX or something, and like a pull-up bar or something where you can hang it from, then you can do suspended leg curls, which are pretty good. Um, you can also do dumbbell leg curls. And if you have a bench, then you can set up like a decline. And then it's actually pretty good because it also hits your hamstrings in that um, contracted position. So that's a pretty good option. And uh, you can do walkouts, which um, I, I, you should just look it up like hamstring walkouts. But basically you're lying on the floor and um, like you kind of you pull your knees up, you push yourself up and you're like slowly walking out with your feet. And it's, it's actually really tough on the hamstrings. A lot of people cannot even do it at first. So yeah, those are some things. And then, yeah, that's mean the lower body, upper body. I mean, you know, push-ups, weighted push-ups and, um, chin-ups, pull-ups and for arms and delts, I think you can, <laughs> you can get creative pretty easily. Okay, so I'll, I'll pick this one because it's like so nice and broad. We can just pick and choose um, how how like broadly we want to answer this. But uh, probably this guy was inspired by my recent cutting pictures. But basically, um, what would be like the first time he wants to go get to 8% body fat, which I hope he doesn't think that I'm at 8% body fat because <laughs> it's definitely not true. According to my decks, so I'm at 24. So, um, <laughs> so what would be our best tips as a first timer who wants to get to 8% body fat? Um, very nice question. Dave, what do you think about this? Yeah. Um, so to answer the question, I mean, I think that would hugely depend on how lean you've already gotten. I mean, if you've gotten to 12%, you know, somebody, somebody asking me that and like, they're like obese and they're like, well, this is what I want to get to. <laughs> I, I just, sometimes somebody's goals are so far and, and like so many steps away that I would just tell them like, you, you, we're not like, I won't even answer the question almost because it's not like to dismiss it. It's just like, look, like you are like five steps away from getting to what you think is like the next step that like, we just have so much to work on. So like, if you're asking this and you're like 25% body fat, and you've cut down from like 35% body fat. Like I just, I, I truly just would not worry about it yet because it's just not gonna be helpful. 
Um, so assuming that you're, let's say you've gotten down to like 12 to 13% before, I'm trying to think of like an effective way to answer this question because I don't know how much of it is going to be different than like a lot of the stuff we've already talked about. You know, I mean, obviously, generally speaking, do it slowly so you can maintain as much mass as possible. I would eat higher voluminous, higher fibrous foods so that you can stay more full. I might consider a shortened eating window so that you have times in the day where you are actually feeling full. Um, obviously sleep, super important. That's probably gonna get disrupted uh, unless you listen to Menno on that. <laughs> but in my opinion, as you get leaner, uh, your sleep may get disrupted. And um, so working on that, but I would just like the overarching point, not again, to just be so broad that it's not helpful, but is just to go really slow and then reassess as you go and see like, how am I actually feeling? Do I need to take a break? And again, I, you could argue with diet breaks are really that effective, but even just mentally, like, do I need to take a break? Um, and, and that's, it's really hard. This is where like, I think coaching is helpful because it can be really hard to judge that. Like maybe Abel would say, I just need to like push through this because if I take a break, I'm not going to go back to it. And maybe somebody else finds that break really helpful. And that month at like maintenance is like, okay, I can push the next two months to finally hit the goal. So, um, I hate to like not give like really good practical takeaways. It's just, it's a pretty broad question. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, he was like in the kind of mid to high teens. I think I saw a picture of him. So he definitely wasn't, wasn't fat or anything, but, uh, it's just kind of a general thing for for everybody to know that when you throw these numbers out, like eight percent body fat or whatever, I always wanna first. I almost wanna ask them, like, okay, show me, show me someone's physique, or maybe you've been that lean before. Like, what do you actually want to achieve? So, is it just an arbitrary image in your head, or an arbitrary number in your head which you associate with a certain physique? or you actually want to get to 8% body fat because 8% body fat is not you diet down until you get a nice six pack. No, that's all the fat. Like later, like you will have to lose so much more fat and so much more weight and the diet will be so much longer than you could ever imagine. And this is ever, ever like the lesson that everybody learns who ever gets there that um, just know what you're getting yourself into. Now, you know, it's fine if you're a little bit underestimating the time and the effort that it takes because you can always kind of modify your goals as you go. So you might get to, you know, 12% body fat, let's say like a legitimate 12% and realize that, man, I'm <laughs> way leaner than I've ever been before. Like who cares if this is only 12%, this is good enough. Right. So there's nothing, yeah. nothing wrong with that. But, you know, just know that 8% body fat is like, in shooting distance from being contest lean, you know, that's three percent body fat away from like elite level bodybuilding conditioning. So that's one thing to know. The other thing to know is that getting leaner is something that, of course, gets harder the leaner you get. But there comes this kind of threshold after which it's like exponentially harder. So going from 10% body fat to eight, I would say is comparable to going from 17% to 10, um, maybe not quite, but, uh, but, but the difficulty just becomes exponential at a certain time or at a certain point. And um, it also becomes slower at the same time. And even if you take it slower, it, only becomes so much easier. So ju just know those things in advance. And otherwise, um, you know, the general things apply. So to go from, you know, high teens in body fat down to low teens, you can do that relatively expediently. To go from the low teens down to maybe a legit 10% body fat, you will have to take it considerably sl more slowly, because otherwise you will just end up losing a shit ton of muscle. Like, I did <laughs> the last time I did this and to go from like not quite single digits yet to like deeper into the single digits or down to 8%, man, you have to take it like really, really slowly. Um, cause 
you know, just just pushing it a little bit harder than what's optimal, you can get away with that when you're a little bit fatter. Like, okay, maybe half a percent of body weight loss would be ideal, but okay, you're losing 0.7%. Okay, whatever. When you're doing that, when you're under 10% body fat, for one, muscle loss risk is just much higher, but also... Like you might only lose weight slightly faster. You only drop your calories by an extra like 200, but fuck, like your appetite just go up, goes up like 1.5 times. <laughs> it's it's just insane. And then your sleep quality goes to shit like immediately. So just, um, you're a sensitive, vulnerable human being at that point. So just be smart and maybe don't do it on your own. And my coaching details, by the way, are, uh, just kidding. Um, so yeah, some cliff notes. Um, did we miss out anything? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, we can pretty much wrap it up here because uh, we've been actually going on for like two hours <laughs> with this recording. Um, we are playing Joe Rogan here. Yeah, so, I would so just tell people, yeah, you know, I, I like the Q and A's that we've been doing. Um, I would say just DM Abel, DM me. You know, I mean, obviously we'll, we'll both answer them, but depending on you know whichever channel. Um, and then if you are listening to this and you have a question, try to word it in a way that we can give you a specific answer because sometimes when it's like so broad, like what do you think about bulking? It's just like, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Maybe we should set up a website like uh, sdavenable.com and then people can submit right. questions just to be professional. All right, folks. So, yeah, this was part two. Go over to Dave's channel to watch part one. Otherwise, subscribe to our channels. Check out our Instagrams here and here. And uh, otherwise, uh, thank you for your attention for today. See you next time.